Hello, we're starting a new chapter today, chapter 21, uh, which is Optical Properties of Materials from your book, William D. Callister. It is kind of a short chapter uh, because we already seen a lot of the um, phenomena that we're going to discuss here in Electrical Properties section already. Okay, so of course, the, uh, the, the definition of the optical property is the material's response to exposure to electromagnetic radiation. If you're talking about the interaction and between the matter, the material, and the electromagnetic uh, wave, that uh, the radiation, then then we have to define the matter first. We already did in chapter two, three, four, and nine, as uh, analyzing the type of bond it makes, type the structure it makes, the defects present in the material, and the phases in the material. So we take that matter, and then we. In this uh, scope of this uh, chapter, we'll be discussing the interaction of that matter with the electromagnetic radiation. More specifically, maybe the visible spectrum of that electromagnetic radiation. Throughout this chapter, we'll define what this electromagnetic radiation, the nature of it, and then uh, the possible interactions in between the, the radiation and the matter. After we define these, uh, we'll be talking about, of course, the applications and certain mechanisms behind it. So uh, what kind of applications out there? There's so many applications that we utilize in their every, everyday life, these optical properties of materials. Um, top four uh, pictures are showing this, uh, the picture of the same guy uh, imaged uh, by different kind of detectors. Uh, from left to right we are increasing the uh, wavelength. Very very left one is the ultraviolet imaging. The, the second picture is you can guess, is the visible uh, imaging, and then a short wave infrared imaging at night, and or at night thermal imaging, uh, long wave or mid wave infrared um, detectors. That is uh, along with the electrical properties, of course, electro optical property of the material is important for these imaging applications. Uh, just like this solar cell application, we already seen it in electrical properties, or this light emitting diode, or this lasers, are all electro-optical uh, applications. So we have to know what is an optical property of the specific material along with the electrical properties. Also, uh, obtaining a light, different color lights. For example, uh, either obtaining a white light, gathering different colors, or uh, from the white light, extracting different colors, or from a certain uh, high energy, low uh, wavelength uh, lights, obtaining other uh, higher uh, wavelength, lower energy light extractions. Um, well, here we see the, the telecommunication fibers that is used for the information uh, transmission. Um, the, the larger the, the amount of information, well, which is increasing every day, as you know, uh, not just by the population increasing, but also the amount of information each person person is uh, generating and um, using or utilizing is increasing. Then there is an increasing need for this uh, information to trans to be transmitted faster, uh, cheaper, uh, lighter, right? So that is uh, accomplished by the optical fibers in telecommunication. We'll talk about those too. Or uh, some fun stuff, um, the 3D imaging in your uh, in movie theaters. Like how do you see the um, 3D movies? That is a light matter interaction as well, because uh, the, the, the specifically a certain kind of uh, image is generated, and that image, which is a light in, in the end, um, interacting with the glasses that you put as an interface in between. How what's really happening there? Or your sunglasses, uh, you wear the sunglasses you, to reduce the glare or to reduce the amount of uh, radiation, especially in high intensity summer days, right? High intensity light summer days. Or if you're wearing um, glasses, just regular glasses, uh, to reduce the amount of reflection of light from the glasses so that your eyes can be seen through. Otherwise, you, you, the more you turn your head, what do you do? You reflect the light that's coming and then that might in the end uh, just, you know, um, affect the other people uh, not seeing your eyes behind the glasses, right? So those anti-reflective coatings, uh, that is the light matter interaction. That is an optical property as well. What is a light? We call that an electromagnetic radiation. 
um, well, classically, it, it was assumed to be the, the, the way property, right? But for uh, the, 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 the quantum approach, uh, it was uh, counted as both particle and wave uh, quality to it. But what is an electromagnetic radiation, which we don't usually call, we call light, right? But different wavelength spectrum or energy spectrum of light coming from sun is called electromagnetic radiation. So if you look at the sun, uh, it is a plasma, right? So in this plasma, there are different nuclear reactions are occurring. Just right now, we're talking uh, at the moment or listening, you listening this talk at the moment, there are different nuclear reactions at different energy levels in that plasma is occurring. So as these uh, reactions are occurring in that the plasma ball, um, it is emitting a spectrum of energies to the space. And as Earth, uh, with a certain distance and certain angle uh, oriented with respect to the Sun, we are obtaining a certain spectrum of those energies and, when, and so to, the, to the Earth. And because of the ozone layer, a uh, certain spectrum of it is uh, reflected back, certain spectrum is transmitted. So we see this white light um, that is coming from the sun uh, is an overall uh, spectrum for this electromagnetic radiation on Earth. So that radiation and the interaction of that radiation with the, uh, the matter that we generated here or any naturally occurring elements matter here on, our, on Earth, we call the optical property. This is from your book. This is a range of um, energies and frequencies and wavelengths for the given uh, wavelength uh, of the electromagnetic radiation. Um, of course, there is a relationship in between the energy of the light and the, the wavelength of the light, uh, which is inversely related. We already seen in electrical properties. But what is an electromagnetic radiation? First of all, uh, electromagnetic is a name that is composed of two names, right? One is electro, the other is magnetic. So, which implies uh, in on its own the radiation, the electromagnetic radiation, is a radiation that is composed of electric and magnetic fields perpendicular to each other. So, uh, in a certain direction, we have an oscillation of electric field, and a, a 90 degree separated or perpendicular to that electro, uh, electric field oscillation, we have a magnetic field oscillation. And uh, based on the relative amplitudes or relative phases with respect to each other, we will be talking about polarization. But before we talk about that, um, the speed of light, speed of this radiation, uh, is called, in vacuum, is called a C constant. That C constant why it is in vacuum because the the to eliminate the 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 matter interaction right so that's the absolute highest uh, velocity that we can get for that specific radiation and that is related with the uh, and is a, it is a constant and it, that constant is coming from one over the uh, square root of uh, electronic electrical and magnetic permittivity why because we have both electrical and magnetic components to the light propagation. So we have to uh, consider both electric and magnetic uh, permittivity coefficients uh, in vacuum, in a square root. That gives me the 3 times 10 to the power 8 uh, meters per second, right? Um, using that and also the frequency uh, of the light, uh, what do we obtain? We obtain the relationship between the energy of that uh, radiation, electromagnetic radiation, um, with respect to the wavelength. We already seen this in electrical properties section, right? So let's take a look at what we're talking about, uh, what we mean uh, by the polarization when we're talking about electromagnetic radiation. So I'm going to show you in a second. Uh, 
little uh, movie clip, uh, but before we see that clip, I'd like to uh, show you what gives me different kind of mode of polarizations. Uh, we can call a linear polarization, we can call a circular polarization, we can call an elliptical polarization. So to get a linear polarization, we'll see in a second in the portion of the movie, um, we, the two components, uh, electrical and magnetic components, oscillating, uh, comparing their phases, what is the com comparison of phase? The peak of the, uh, the oscillations for the, the electric field and the peak of the oscillations for the magnetic field are overlapping. They are aligned. They are peak to peak. They're, they're corresponding to the same um, wavelength. Okay, that's the uh, phase. If there's a phase difference, for example, uh, 90 degrees, 180 degrees, or 270 degrees, whatever you want to call, then you will get the peak to peak uh, match at different points. Like this time, this peak will not match the peak of the magnetic field. So they're going to be experienced at different points when there is a, a phase difference in between them. So to have a linear polarization of a light, we have to have the uh, amplitudes first, the height of these oscillations, and also the um, phase difference, the, 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 at the degrees at which these guys peak, the oscillations peak, should be the same. Okay? If they're the same, then uh, the, if I put a certain screen perpendicular to the incoming um, electromagnetic radiation, I see a linear uh, oscillation. But if the amplitudes are the same, but, but only the uh, phase is different. In other words, um, if I have the same kind of peak height for magnetic and electrical components, but their phases are different, they peak at different angles, then I created on the screen perpendicular to this electromagnetic radiation, I see this circular polarization mode. For the elliptical, no wonder, not only the phase is different, but also the amplitudes are different for uh, electrical and magnetic components of the radiation. Let's take a look at this uh, video. Electromagnetic wave. Here. This visualization shows a... So in this visualization from the film sense, I gave you the, the link to this. This is originally from the uh, ellipsometry measurements. You're not really uh, responsible for what ellipsometry is, but ellipsometric uh, measurement is, the, uh, is a tool that is used to measure a thickness of a certain material, a non-metal, and also uh, the refractive index of that uh, material uh, by utilizing incoming and reflected light polarization properties. That is why this company who produces this ellipsometry is FilmSense explaining the working principle of their devices. But I cut out a certain uh, portion of this um, ellipsometry uh, equipment uh, explanation just for the electromagnetic wave part, okay? So here, uh, as you can see, the oscillations are shown, the red ones are the electric field, and the blue ones are uh, shown as the magnetic field. And let's see uh, from the previous discussion if the amplitudes or the phase is the same, or amplitude the same, phase difference, or both different, how does the a polarization is called linear, circular, or elliptical. I'd like you to pay attention, of course, the nature of that oscillations here and respective to each other, but also please take a look at the end result. This is what we see. That's the perpendicular screen here that uh, experiences the overall movement of the electrical and magnetic field. Let's take a look at it. So the red ones are the electric field. As you can see, the blue and red ones. What's really happening? What, what is an observer right here? What do you see? You see the blue ones and red ones, right? Uh, if you draw a, a line that is peaking, what kind of uh, geometry you would see? 
uh, if there is only electrical component, of course we call it a linearly polarized field. Okay. At that screen, we we see either up and down uh, oscillation, and that is a linearly polarized state. You, you can obtain this linear polarization by having the same amplitude and same um, phase in the electrical and magnetic components as well. So please pay attention. Uh, don't for, forget about this part. Just take a look at the part where you see um, this linear polarization this time is not 90 degrees, um, just like the single uh, electrical um, field oscillation, right? It will up and down. Once I introduce the, uh, the magnetic field that is, look, is in the same amplitude and same height, right? Amplitude and the phase, they are corresponding to each other, these peaks, like the first case in the previous slide. What are we obtaining in the screen? We're getting a linear polarization again but this time, what is it? It is 45 degrees rotated. Okay. Okay, so if we have this time, uh, please take a look at it. Uh, the, the, the amplitudes are the same, but the peaks are offset. There is a phase difference in between them. And look what we see in the screen. The overall vector is uh, giving this circular polarization state. On the other hand, we don't only have the phase difference, but also the amplitude difference. Look, this time I have uh, the height of the, the, the field, the electric, uh, magnetic field oscillation is less intense than the electric field oscillation. And what do I obtain? This time I'm obtaining a non-circular elliptical shape polarization on the screen. Well, that's the uh, basic principle behind this, uh, how to play with the light's polarization. So um, the principle behind the working of this 3D movie glasses, uh, I'll talk about. But before then, I'd like to talk about the sunglasses. In sunglasses, we're utilizing this linear polarization. So um, that interface that you're using is uh, polarized in a certain direction. Uh, when the sunbeam comes to Earth, it comes with um, different polarization orientations. Uh, what does that mean? A sunbeam composed of many lights, uh, the light vectors, that has a different uh, electrical and magnetic oscillation. So each one of them, when in a bunch of, uh, in, a, uh, in a beam of light when it comes, so there are many uh, polarization directions coming from that light. So if you look overall to the sunlight, there's no one single polarization, but there is there is many different polarization uh, directions. So that makes the overall sunbeam is unpolarized. When we wear sunglasses and in between that unpolarized light and the light that is polarized, uh, sorry, the, and the polarizer in a certain direction, we eliminate certain amount of glare that is perpendicular to the uh, incoming light uh, polarization vector. So uh, that's how we protect uh, the, our eyes and the damage which might be caused by the uh, sunlight, especially in the su hot summer days, right? For the uh, 3D movie glasses, the, uh, the light is circularly, circular circularly polarized. Uh, you see one of them is blue, one of them is red. The blue one uh, is circular, right circular pol pol polarized on your right hand side and then the, the sorry, the, on your left uh, one and the, on the right uh, side, which is a red in this case, right, um, it is left polarized. So this circular polarization, it is in the opposite direction. So the, the movie theater projects two different images, okay, and each with an opposite polarization. So you're uh, yeah, either with the two camera lenses or with a certain frequency, okay? So your eyes see two offset images coming to your eyes and uh, at a certain distance to match the distance between the eyes uh, so that you see the three-dimensional image, okay? So 
utilizing the circular polarization, you can see a depth to a incoming image, of course, using the distance between your eyes as well. Okay, okay so um, here are some concept check questions. Um, let's define a little more what is an electromagnetic wave which is a photon, right? So the question is asking, briefly discuss the similarities and differences between photons and phonons. What is a photon? What is a phonon? Photon is the uh, specific uh, electromagnetic radiation that we just talked about, light, right? Phonons, on the other hand, was the uh, thermal vibrations in the lattice, right? So based on the thermal energy, these lattices vibration uh, resonance frequency at a certain frequency that resonates, that creates an acoustic wave in the material. So both phonons and photons are treated as a wave. But as a difference, photons is also dual uh, property. It is also treated as a particle. Photons uh, have much... Uh, higher uh, velocities, right, the speed of light that we're talking about. On the other hand, from phonons, it is speed of sound. Um, phonons exist in the uh, in a certain uh, media, okay, it, it, it is a result of that media, inside that media it exists. Photon, on the other hand, is a radiation, it doesn't require a media, but it can interact with different kind of medias. Let's see the other concept check question. Electromagnetic radiation may be treated from the classical or the quantum mechanical press perspective. Briefly compare these two points. Of course, um, another important difference from the, for the previous question comes from this analysis. Uh, in the classical um, perspective, uh, the, the, the electromagnetic radiation was assumed to be a wave and it can, it was assumed to be to exist in uh, every energy level but in the quantum mechanical perspective it exists as a wave and a particle and because of that dual nature um, the energy of this radiation can exist in certain energy states and it can be quantized that's the main difference okay Right, so we define the, the light, what is an electromagnetic radiation, what kind of nature it has, and then let's see what kind of interactions it can do, um, we can observe uh, with the matter, with the solid matter. When an, a, a light comes uh, to my matter, uh, these are the possible things that can happen. One, it can reflect. Two, it can transmit or it can be absorbed. The scattering event in, in this absorption uh, also is counted in this absorption um, process here. So based on these interactions, I define my matter optically. I can define my matter optically transparent. I can define my matter optically opaque. And I can define my matter in between translucent. What gives a mat my matter a transparent quantity? Of course, uh, the energy of the, the light, um, which we call, the, for example, a visible light, if uh, we pick a spe specific spectrum, if that light within that range, the visible spectrum, passing through my material, my matter, then that matter to be called the interaction of that light with that matter is dominated by the transmittance of that light, then that matter is called a transparent material. If these interactions, the reflection is dominated, then that material is called opaque kind of material. Like what kind of materials are transparent? Glass, for example, right? Or um, sapphire, crystalline sapphire, right? Or uh, what kind of materials are assumed to be opaque, mostly reflecting the incoming light? Um, they're called the metals, for example, right? Um, translucent, on the other hand, has a certain kind of transmittance, and maybe some amount of reflectance, but more uh, scattering dominated inside the material. The reason for that is the light, uh, once it enters into the material, after certain amount is reflected, of course, um, 
before it gets out from the material by means of transmission, it reflects and scatters from the interfaces or impurities or imperfections inside the material. The more grain boundaries I have, for example, more polycrystal in the material is, more dopings or uh, ion additions into the material, what is that going to create? It's going to create more scattering centers for the light as it's um, transferring or traveling through the material. Okay, so that kind of behavior is called the translucent, translucency. So if I um, define a certain percent, uh, like a certain amount for a total amount of intensity of a light incoming to my matter, which is 100%, which is equal to 1, that is divided into these three main events uh, when it interacts with the material. If it's like more than 90% reflection dominance or transmission dominance or absorption and scattering dominance. So that determines the type of um, optical property of my material. Of course, these interactions in the atomistic scale is closely related with the energy bands and the, of course uh, the, the quantum particles that we call the uh, electrons or uh, ions, right? So the interaction of the light with the matter is closely related with the electrical properties as well. So if you look at the metals, let's, let's remember the electrical properties lecture one, the part one, right? That uh, lecture is part one. Um, we define a band gap. How do we define the band gap? Number of atoms gathering together, um, creating these uh, closely spaced energy levels. And in the case of metals, there was no gap in between them. Indeed, there are so many electrons and so many energy levels, they get so close to each other, they stack up so close to each other, we call them continuum of states, as if there is, they're not discrete levels, Indeed, they are discrete, but they're so close to a tightly uh, placed, then we call them a continuum of states in the case of metals, right? So with the insulators and semiconductors, these continuum of states are separated from each other with a uh, phenomenon we just defined, a band gap, right? And the, the size of that band gap determines the type, if it's an insulator or a semiconductor. So uh, for a single atom, if I send a light with a certain energy, the electron in the outermost, the free electron or the, the valence electron, let's say, not the free electron, the valence electron on the out, outer orbit, uh, you're going to have to give a certain amount of energy to raise that electron up to the next available energy states. And then uh, when it falls back, it gives off that much energy radiation, maybe. Right? That's the electron transition for a single atom. It's no difference for metals or um, the semiconductors and insulators. But in the case of metals, um, let me explain it here on this uh, structure here. For metals, uh, as a nature for the, the, the metallic bond as well, once we bring these atoms together at a certain lattice, um, in a certain repeating order in a lattice, right? Um, these extra plenty of electrons in this, in this continuum of states are free to move around. So, and they um, created this collective or uh, common commodity electrons, which we call them C or gas of electrons. Once the light comes in, in like uh, incident to the uh, surface, what will happen is um, these uh, electrons, based on the periodic potential present in the material, which are the ion cores, right, will oscillate. And they will be quantized at a certain level and they will create these uh, oscillations with respect to this periodic potential. Um, based on the light's, of course, uh, energy, uh, it will absorb or um, convert that into these plasmonic oscillations and then uh, eventually it will uh, re-emit the light uh, out of phase uh, in no time uh, against this incoming light. So that 
uh, out of phase uh, re -emit em emittance of these plasmonic surface plasmons on the surface of these oscillations of these negative charges is called a reflection. So uh, if the metal, we call it opaque. Why? Because at a certain depth, at a certain thickness, this interaction is occurring. If I picked a certain, uh, my metal is uh, less than a certain thickness, um, such as maybe 100 nanometers, uh, my metal gets uh, more transparent to the light that is incoming. Uh, I'm going to, in the uh, upcoming slide, I'm going to be showing the, the, the interaction of these uh, incoming light with the smaller size metals, what kind of uh, features we can see in nanoparticles. But this the, the, the definition of the reflection is the re-emittance of the incident light indeed in metals. Uh, so this reflection, uh, 90, 99, 95% of the incoming light is reflected back. And the rest of it, 5 to 10% for metals, goes into the heat, thermal, uh, radiation or heat in the material we're going to see in thermal properties in the upcoming section but let's take a look at a uh, different metals uh, reflection spectrum most of the metals if you look at the periodic table looks like a silver or aluminum right uh, sorry it's all more like a, a grayish color right why because whatever is coming in the visible spectrum to our eye looks like it is reflected back 100 percent of it so the overall color for all uh, um, color reflection looks white right so it's the case for silver but take a look at it the, the in the ultraviolet region silver has some reflectivity but our eyes cannot see what our eyes can see is in between 0.4 to 0.7 micron in between this 0.4 and 0.7 micron, if I blow it up, what metals do we see in different color? Gold and copper, for example. Gold uh, reflects light up until uh, the yellowish color, which is around 0.5 micron, right? Uh, or 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 micron. And then copper, on the other hand, looks more reddish color. Why? Because it is uh, reflecting. Uh, the light after the point, uh, 55.6 micron, which is uh, more like this, uh, corresponding to red color. So the, 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 the color of metals are uh, characterized by in what uh, wavelength range they are um, reflecting the light, right? So the, the copper reflects after... Um, 0.55 micron or 6 micron maybe and gold is doing that after 0.5 micron that's why the gold looks yellow and copper looks red but i like to show you in like a, a interesting property if i go to small size for gold and not only going to small size in gold if i go to different uh, morphologies morphology means shapes Okay, instead of having a, a, um, a completely spherical uh, equal uh, length shape, if I have like a anisotropic, like elongated shapes or different shapes for um, a, a cup, a gold, for example, I'm going to get different kind of light coming out. But how is that possible? That surface plasmon effect that I mentioned uh, for the surface of the sea of electrons, um, the, the surface of a metal, that reflection principle, uh, takes a different shape when we go to nano size. Well, um, since the beginning um, of this term, we're seeing the, the property of materials, but mostly we're seeing the the properties in bulk sizes. We did not really discuss much about what really happens if I go to smaller sizes and so on, except in electrical properties section. Um, we talked about the quantum confinement and also some kind of um, density of states in that concept. But coming back to our discussion here, the surface plasmons uh, in combination with the size of the metal. Let's say instead of having a bulk gold I have, what color do, am I getting from bulk gold? Yellow color, right? So after a certain size, what's happening? We're getting this um, 
the plasmons, the, the, the incoming light, and then that in, incoming light, only the spectrum of it after 0.5 micron is re-emitted. But in the case of a smaller sized gold particles, uh, let's talk about a uh, isotropic shape, like a spherical shape, and the magnetic field vectors uh, oscillate at the uh, same frequency, right? So they create these standing waves at, at a certain resonance frequency for the same resonance frequency in both directions. But if the size of this particle was anisotropic, we would get a different uh, resonance frequencies in for electrical and magnetic field, which created this um, the light that we see uh, in actual reality. So the the optical properties of nonmetals um, we're going to be talking about the refraction in nonmetals, um, and within that scope we'll be defining the, the 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 index of refraction. We know uh, a light travels at a certain speed in vacuum that we call c, and that c was a um, function of a relative. Uh, electrical and magnetic permeabilities uh, coefficients for vacuum. In the case of uh, an, a material, when the, the slide going in the vacuum enters into a material, it's not going to go at the same speed. The speed of light will uh, get less, so the, the, the speed will decrease. How much it will decrease is determined by the refractive index. So if you see here, the ratio of um, the light traveling in vacuum over the light traveling, the speed of light traveling in vacuum over the speed of light traveling in a material, that ratio is called the refractive index. Of course, different uh, colors uh, of light travels at a different speed. So you see here for index of refraction for glass, as I increase the wavelength, the refractive index decreases. In other words, as I increase the, uh, the wavelength, uh, the velocity will, the velocity of the lights uh, will increase. So the refractive index decreases. If you look at this um, prism here, uh, the combination of all colors, which we call the white light, uh, once it gets into a prism at a certain angle, it will be diffracted at a different speed. So because of that different speed diffraction, we're going to see the separation of uh, lights and we uh, extract the, the different color lights uh, from the combination of light, white light, by means of uh, uh, lights, wavelength, like the index of refractions, wavelength dependency. So, the refractive index uh, determines how fast the light travels in the material, right? If you have a ceramic, for example, here's a very good uh, concept check question. I have a few silica glass, okay? So, the silica is composed of SiO2 right here. I see here silica glass, 1.4, 1.5, maybe, uh, refraction, uh, index of refraction n value. The question is asking, will the index of refraction increase as I add alumina, titanium oxide, nickel oxide, magnesium oxide? Why? You may find here. 12.3. The idea behind it is, larger the ions I have uh, compared to the mother ion. What is the ion uh, in, present in the uh, silica? Silicon, right? So let's take a look at the, the ionic size of the silicon, which is 0.04 nanometers, 0.4 angstrom. That's the size of the ionic radius for uh, silicon plus 4. If I add aluminum oxide, for example, the ion in aluminum oxide is aluminum plus 3, which, is, uh, an, which has an ionic radius of 0.53 angstrom. Titanium, on the other hand, let's take a look at it. It's even bigger, 0.6 um, angstrom. Nickel, let's take a look at it. Even bigger, point, almost 0. 0.7 angstrom. There's magnesium. Um, it's even bigger. It gets bigger. It's uh, 0. 0.72 angstrom. So when I add 
alumina, titanium oxide, nickel oxide, magnesium oxide in the silica, what's going to happen? Those positive uh, ions of silica will be replaced with larger ions. So if there's a larger ions replaced in the silica centers, silicon centers, uh, the light coming in will be diffracted more or slowed down more. So therefore, the reflective index will uh, increase. Okay. Let's talk about the reflection on the basis of a refractive index. If we define the speed at which this, uh, the, the refractive index is the ratio of the speed of light in vacuum over the speed of light at a certain media, uh, more resistance for that light to travel, in other words, smaller the velocity, higher the refractive index. So the air's refractive index is being one. And uh, um, the, the water is, for example, refractive index being um, larger value, right? So uh, we can obtain how much of the light coming from the water will be reflected back and transmit at, at what angle. Similarly, from air to water, what percent of the light is reflected or how much of it will be transmitted? The idea is this. The uh, amount of reflected light is determined by the relative um, refractive indexes. N2 being where it's going, N1 being where it's coming. Okay, uh, From air to solid, for example, uh, N1 is air, N2 is the uh, a solid material. Okay, 2 is where it's going to, 1 where it's coming from. So if I take the difference between them, um, and ration it to the uh, addition of those refractive indexes to each other, uh, larger the difference between them, like N2 being much larger than N1, then this ratio will be larger. So it's no wonder if I'm coming from a, for example, very um, small refractive index going into higher refractive index, I'm light, I'm traveling at a certain speed, and then I come to a media that is, has higher refractive index where I'm going to slow down. I don't want to go in there. I would reflect back. Basic idea. So there's a very, um, uh, there's an application area that we can use. I'm going to give two different uh, case studies for this uh, refractive index uh, phenomena. For example, in LED packaging, if I have a, an LED based on gallium nitride, which is uh, blue or ultraviolet, we can talk about in that range, right? The refractive index of that um, LED light emitting diode is 2.38. The refractive index of air is 1. So think about, I'm applying a voltage difference to this material, and then you've seen it in electrical properties. What do, you, do I obtain? I, based on the band gap, I obtain a certain light. And that light generated in that uh, semiconductor wants to get out. But the refractive index, while it's traveling inside that material where it's generated, that light uh, has a refractive index of 2.38. Where it's getting out, it's 1. So there is a huge difference in between them. So what's going to happen? It will uh, eventually reflect back based on this uh, reflection rule here. Um, a lot more because the difference between them is large. But instead of doing that, coming from the 2.38 refractive index and going into 1, if I put a material in between, uh, well, it happens to be epoxy. It's not only because to arrange this refract uh, refraction behavior, but also to protect my, um, it's a packaging material, to protect the semiconductor. But it turns out to be, I picked the specific material uh, specifically for a refractive index being in between the, the index value of uh, the semiconductor and air, which is 1.5. So the light from the semiconductor uh, with this refractive index into 1.5 will be reflected back less, so we will subtract the light out more. Um, and more light subtracted into this environment continue on from 
This time, instead of going from 238 to 1 directly reflecting very, very large values, I go gradually from 238 to 1.5 and then 1.5 to 1, increasing the amount of light subtracted from this material, for example. Uh, there are some research groups I remember that were working on uh, even grading the refractive index value here to improve the, uh, to uh, get rid of this reflection a lot more. How? Starting with a larger uh, refractive index and going into adjusting the refractive index from 1.5 to 1, for example, or 1.7 to 1, so that it uh, is reflected less as it's um, moving out. Well, that example might be very um, uh, useful when we're talking about optical fibers and telecommunication. As I said, uh, there is so much, too much information is processed uh, in the world right now. So to, pr to process these, they're also transmitted by means of glass fibers. So compared to the copper transmission, um, this is both like weight wise and also the, the number of um, transactions wise, it's superior. So these optical fibers I'm going to show in a second here is made up of a high purity silica in between, in the middle, there's a wire, silica wire, and around the silica wire, there's a cladding layer. So in this setup, uh, if I have an input signal to the encoder, uh, it is uh, transmitted into ones and zeros. One is the, the uh, um, signal that is high, and high up. Zeros are uh, the signals that are below a certain intensity value. So while it's transmitting, sometimes you lose the information. You get uh, you just um, that intensity might be it might get a little less. So there are repeaters people put in between to intensify the signal, and as it transmitted to the point where you want to decode and use that information, there is a decoder, and then you have an output signal. But in between the encoder and decoder, you have a fiber that transmits that information, and in between to uh, uh, amplify or just intensify the signal if it, the, the information is lost, there are repeaters. So for this uh, telecommunication setup, uh, I'm going to give you two examples with the different refractive index. Um, the, right in the center of the cladding, we they were using, this is the uh, type of, I'm going to let, let me blow it up. Uh, if this is from the center to the outside of this um, wire, radial uh, distribution of the refractive index was uh, made to be uh, very large in the center and smaller outside so that it's wave guided, it's um, confined in the center of the, um, the silica, high purity silica uh, wire, then eventually uh, the, the, the signal gets lost and it gets broadened and then uh, lose the intensity of the signal because of this um, random reflections from the surface. Instead of doing that, uh, people did um, they, this adjusted addition uh, of, uh, instead of using the silica, remember, uh, they doped this from inside to out with increasing amount of boron oxide or germanium oxide to vary the refractive index from center to out instead of having a like a sharp interface uh, um, refractive index difference there is a graded refractive index created right at the core of the the wire so that uh, the intensity of the light that is um, or the information that we create as one signal is not lost through the um, fiber wave guided okay okay so we already seen this uh, absorption phenomena for non-metal semiconductors or insulators even um, the highest occupied valence band electrons if, they, if they're excited to the lowest unoccupied conduction band levels then uh, if and, and if that uh, free carrier is let down let down back from that energy level uh, it will emit uh, light uh, 
after it absorbed that energy and uh, let that energy go, of course, that's called emittance, uh, it will give off a light that is equal amount uh, to the uh, band gap energy value. We already seen that in electrical properties. And that amount was the 1.24 over lambda. Uh, let me ask you a question. Um, so the stress, the, the, if the interaction in between the matter and the light is reflection, um, transmittance, and absorption. To have a non-metal, to have this absorption process, light comes in, uh, a certain amount is reflected back with that uh, refractive index difference. And then after that, what happens? Uh, that light's energy is photon's energy is absorbed. How much energy is required to be absorbed? At least that band gap energy. Below that band gap energy, the electromagnetic spectrum will be what? Will be eliminated. So what does that elimination mean? It will pass through the material. So the material will be transparent to a certain wavelength range and below a certain wavelength range or over a certain band gap value and over those energies, it will be absorbing that. So we've seen that in solar cell example, especially in the electrical properties part. So for a, a wavelength operation uh, that is greater than the band gap value, I can either generate carriers and collect them for a solar cell, or what do I do? I create these generate uh, carriers and then let them uh, emit a light in the uh, band gap value. In any value, any energy spectrum from the electromagnetic radiation that is below this value, the band gap value, will be the material, the matter, will be transparent to it. So based on this, uh, the incidence reflected in transmitted beams, the rest of it is the amount of radiation absorbed. How do I see a material, for example, some glass, for example, but it is green colored or some transparent material, a light comes in and a certain amount passes, only I see the red color. The amount at which this material absorbs, that means for that spectrum, for that specific wavelength range around that uh, color, it is absorbed and the rest is transmitted. Therefore, I see the absorbed light. So please pay attention. The color that I see in metals is the reflected light, yellow for gold or the, the red for copper. For non-metals, on the other hand, it is the absorbed light I see as the color of that transparent material. Let's see this concept check questions. Are the elemental semiconductors, silicon and germanium, transparent to visible light? Well, it is a very simple question that you could have answered last week when you watched the uh, electrical properties section as well. Um, silicon, what is the band gap of silicon? And what is the electromagnetic wave radiation range, right? So the band gap for silicon was 1.11, I believe, right? Electron volts. For that 1.11 volts corresponding wavelength, um, let's make a simple math here. That's very simple. We, we already made that in the electrical properties part, but 1.24 over 1.11, almost 1100 <coughs> angstrom, or sorry, nanometers, or 1.1 micron. If I have a wavelength spectrum, um, from ultraviolet to the uh, infrared, any wavelength 1.1 and over will be transparent. Anything below that wavelength range, because the energy of the light will be higher than that 1.11 electron volts, it will be absorbed by that silicon. So, uh, is the, the, the visible light uh, in that range? Yes, it is 0.4 to 0.7 roughly, which is below uh, 1.1 micron and uh, which is higher than that uh, band gap value of silicon so it will not be transparent all the light coming in will be absorbed similarly for germanium let's take a look at the um, other concept check question compare the factors that determine the characteristics colors of metals and transparent met non-metals i just said that um based on uh 
what is absorbed or what is transmitted uh, determines the uh, transparent nonmetals. Uh, the non absorbed light that is transmitted through the material uh, determines the wavelength of the, the our vision. But on the other hand, for metals, the rest uh, after the absorption, which is the reflected light from the surface, determines the color of metals. We are talking about the opacity, translucency, and, uh, and transparency. Let's talk about a few phenomena. Uh, we are already familiar from the electrical properties uh, discussions. Luminescence, fluorescence, and phosphorescence. Luminescence uh, is actually the, the, the materials absorbing the energy and then re-emitting it is called, yeah, in other words, the, the, the charges excitement to um, a certain energy level. And then while it's falling back to its original position, giving a, a light out, which is called the luminescence. Luminescence, I'm going to add two more new jargons here, can be either um, photoluminescence or electroluminescence because those carriers can be excited to the conduction band by means of uh, applying a voltage difference that's called electroluminescence. If I'm shining an electromagnetic radiation to that matter and then if those uh, elements, these uh, charges, uh, gets excited to the next available level by means of a certain spectrum of light energies, then it's called a photo, and as a result it emits the light, then it's called a photoluminescence, okay? So the luminescence can be can have either a fluorescent or phosphorescent character. Uh, the main difference between them, the amount the, of time these events are occurring. Okay, so main difference: fluorescence happens in a short amount of time, like much less than a one second. The luminescence time. Phosphorescence, on the other hand, we are very uh, familiar with the glow sticks, right? We break them, and then that glow sticks uh, phosphorus. Uh, is called phosphorescence. Another optical uh, phenomenon I'd like to talk about, obtaining a white color. So the, getting the white color into prism and um, separating it into different colors, like rainbow, right, uh, was a one concept. But in our daily life, in our uh, lightning, for example, uh, in our homes, uh, a white light is used. So how do you obtain a light, white light? There are three main uh, ways to obtain a white light. Of course, uh, you can have a light emitting diode in blue. In blue. This is called a um, color chart. So in the, the uh, CIE chart. So for the CIE uh, chart, the ends of this chart, maybe you've seen this in your computer while you're trying to find certain colors, right? There are three main colors. Uh, we have blue, green, and red. Of course, which one has the highest energy? Lowest wavelength one. Which one is the lowest wavelength? Blue one. So the blue, green, and red. Blue, green, and red, the corners of it. The one that has the low, highest energy, lowest wavelength, the one has the lowest energy, highest wavelength, and the one right in the middle, which is green. Those three colors makes up the three main colors to mix uh, to obtain a white color. So I either uh, create green, blue, and red uh, light emitting diodes and combine them and have them uh, luminous, electroluminous. And then I overall, when I look at these three uh, luminescence characteristics, what do I see to the eye right in the center? White. Or instead of uh, creating three different colors here, I can obtain a blue light in the back here, and then I combine that with the yellow phosphorus, like this, putting light, yellow phosphorus in front of the blue light emitting diode, um, by uh, right in the center by adjusting the power and also the amount of uh, the 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 type of phosphorus here, I can obtain a white light here. Another way of doing that is using ultraviolet light. And uh, instead of this time, this we are here in the ultraviolet region, instead of using a yellow phosphorus, uh, 
uh, we are obtaining, we can use a mixture of different color phosphorus and we obtain white light. Let me pay, uh, draw your attention to something very important here. Um, as you may know, back in 2016, the Nobel Prize was given to invention of the blue light here. That's extremely important because blue, uh, people asked back then like why it was given the, to the blue light. Um, what is so special about the blue light, right? We already had the green and we already had the red, of course, right? Um, LEDs, why it was not given to that the red, but the blue. The reason for that is with the red higher wavelength and low energy, you cannot obtain the rest of the visible colors here. But if you are on the other end of the spectrum, high energy, low, uh, lower uh, wavelength, by means of blue, you can subtract any of the colors above all the, of the visible spectrum. Okay, you don't need to create a separate red LED or green LED. By means of blue, uh, combining with any other um, lower energy band gap value put in, in front of it, I have a higher energy emitting light here. I have a smaller band gap material here, just like that yellow phosphorus here. What happens? This yellow phosphor absorbs this energy because this is much higher than this band gap value. And, and then as soon as it absorbs, it photoluminous, it phosphorus, right? We already seen this, um, the operating principle behind the solar cells. I'm not going to really go into it much, but let's remember by uh, getting the sunlight spectrum, uh, specifically, for example, for um, silicon, we just calculated a minute ago, uh, 1, 1 micron and below any wavelength ranges or any uh, energy of the electromagnetic separation, uh, electromagnetic radiation is absorbed by the material. And once it's absorbed, what is the principle behind absorption? Uh, promoting those free, the, the electrons, valence carriers to the higher uh, much next level, which is in the conduction band, their parts in the conduction process, collecting those electrons, promoted to the next level, uh, and utilizing that as an electrical energy is called the photoconductivity. Okay. So um, here is another concept check question: Is the semiconductor zinc selenide, which has a band gap of 2.58 electron volts? As soon as we see the electron volts band gap value, what do we do? We find the corresponding wavelength. If I put 2.58 here, I obtain 0.4806 micron, which is 480 nanometers approximately. So if I have a zinc cellulite material with 258 electron volts photoconductive when exposed to visible light radiation, what is the visible light range? 400 to 700. If I have a band gap 2.58 corresponding to 480 nanometers wavelength, and if I have a spectrum of light coming in as a visible range, 400 to 700, which uh, wavelength range will it be transparent? First question. Or uh, is it going to be, is it going to create a photoconductivity in the material? In other words, the spectrum, among the spectrum of light, among those uh, wavelengths, which energy photons will be able to promote those electrons from the bottom uh, top of the valence to the uh, bottom of the uh, valence band? 480 micron and below, right? In other words, 258 electron volts and above energies will be absorbed by zinc selenide. For the rest of it, 480 to 700, it will be transparent. All that light will pass through the zinc selenide material with no absorption, no creating this photoconductive effect. That's an important example. Okay, um, for photovoltaic detectors, uh, it is very similar to solar cells. Again, you have a certain spectrum uh, of light is coming in with a certain um, corresponding to a certain material groups. 
uh, for example, uh, from that uh, pictures here, um, if you want to do a near ultraviolet de detection of the, the face or visible detection, near IR or short wave infrared or mid wave or long wave infrared thermal detection, uh, we are increasing the wavelength here. And of course, the, uh, the material which detects the light gets smaller and smaller uh, band gap value. Therefore, if you want to do a different kind of photo detection, we are using different kind of materials with different band gap values. So you, there is a, a summary of um, those material groups for different uh, course, different application area. In other words, if you want to do short wave near infrared detection at night vision, for example, and this is night vision too, but the principle behind it from capturing the thermal energy from the object here this is still working like a reflection but anyhow um, different detection mechanisms use different materials based on their band gap values so that uh, you only utilize that spectrum of light just like solar cell example okay led on the other hand is an opposite effect uh, here if you're in opposite of the detectors right instead of capturing the lights uh, what are we doing? Uh, we're applying the voltage difference, we make the carriers to combine uh, at a certain region, which we call the active region, at a forward bias to give off the light. Okay, I'm going to pass that, and this is the last part of our discussion. Then we're going to wrap up the. Uh, this is the last two or three um, slides of this optical properties section. Uh, last uh, application is lasers. Lasers stands for light amplification by stimulated light amplification. Um, here's a very good example, uh, a, a picture. If I uh, blow it up here and move it away. So once I have a certain uh, energy promoting this carrier up here, which was called absorption, right? Uh, this absorption can occur by means of a light or applying a voltage difference. A voltage difference creates what? Uh, electroluminescence. If I'm shining a light on it with a certain energy, uh, that's called a phosphor, uh, photoluminescence, okay? So either way, I'm giving a su sufficient amount of energy to the sky to um, promote, get promoted, absorbed, and then I let it go. Once the, the charge goes back to its original position, it gives off this emission with what we call the spontaneous emission. And this was the photoluminescence, and that was the characteristics of uh, light emitting diodes, for example. But in the case of a laser, what makes a difference between a laser and a light emitting diode is we intentionally create an atmosphere inside the material, it's the same material maybe, but we create an atmosphere where this absorption and spontaneous emission occurs, but this, as a result of the spontaneous emission, we don't let that em emitted uh, photon out. We intentionally keep it in, reflect it back, so that while it's reflecting back inside, it uh, creates this promotion for another, another electron. While that electron is passing, uh, dropping by, uh, it creates another photon. I captured as that photon inside the material again. I have it reflected back intentionally. And then each reflected back photon creates another uh, pair. And then eventually it avalanches, it crawls out. And after a certain emission uh, light output, um, we are obtaining inside this crawling out, this avalanche, uh, photon formation. Previously, when we were doing this one by one, bit by bit, it was a spontaneous emission, but this uh, snowball effect of these uh, absorption on top of the absorption, um, the, the absorption by the emitted light inside the material, each photon, creates the stimulated light emission inside. But how do we obtain the stimulated light emission? But in other words, how to create this uh, reflecting back inside the material and creating uh, abs uh, absorption from a subsequent emission? 
So this is how you can obtain. This is an example for a ruby laser or for semiconductor laser. There are different kinds of lasers, of course. But what's really happening here is a ruby is a sapphire doped with a certain percentage chromium 3 plus ions. Inside this ruby, inside this um, sapphire, these chromium ions uh, present and one end, I intentionally create fully silvered surface and on the other end, I created a partially silvered surface. So guess what? Fully silvered surface is almost 100% reflecting the generated light. And when it comes to the partially uh, silvered surface, some light is emitted out, some light reflects back. So this reflection between those perfectly flat surfaces creates a reabsorption and re-emission and this snowballing of a launch effect inside the material. While you're still emitting a light out, after a certain number of photons generated inside, each photon creates another photon. And then in the end, before you know, you have this uh, high intensity, the self-stimulated uh, emission, which is called a laser. In the case of a ruby, uh, this light emission happens uh, with the promotion of the valence electrons in the, the chromium dope ions. But in the case of, case of a semiconductor lasers, uh, this emission is, is occurring within the band gap. So here you're seeing, let me blow it up again. This is the last slide. We're almost done with the chapter. We created a, a layer by layer uh, material in which we have a negative type and positive type of electrodes, right? Just like from the electrical properties section, the LEDs. Um, these electrodes, uh, has uh, N-type, N-P-type and N-type dope regions, these materials, and the army of electrons and army of lack of electrons are forced to combine at this uh, region, this here, this gallium arsenide region, which we call the active region. The difference between a laser and an LED is we created a fully reflective and half ripped the partially reflective surfaces. On the other hand of this laser, the semiconducting laser, we have a, like a perfectly flat reflective surface by covering it with some kind of high reflectivity metal. And at this surface where we want the light out, we partially covered it. So the light we generate inside is oscillating in between these two surfaces while it's oscillating uh, uh, at a coherent uh, uh, wavelength and frequency, it is creating, multiplying the number of uh, excited electrons and also eventually emitted uh, light from the conduction to valence band. So this crowding out and effect is occurring within the band gap for the um, semiconductor lasers. On the other hand, for the ruby crystal, the idea is promoting those valence electrons to the next available state and uh, to the excited state and having it drop back to its original position. Either of them will give off a photon and that uh, generated photon, if I capture it inside in between two mirrors, um, will create more photon pairs and more uh, photon pairs will create more um, having this uh, um, emission mechanism uh, going from spontaneous emission to stimulated emission and and this in the outside we're observing the lasing characteristics okay all right so this is uh, pretty much it we're concluding the uh, chapter 21 i believe the optical properties and after this uh we will be getting into thermal properties uh which is chapter 19 i believe um i'll get to see you there take care